Bridge to All Decks. It's time for a very special episode of Enterprise Incidents with Scott and Steve. I'm Scott Nance. I am Steve Morris, and I feel like, I don't know if you've ever had this experience where you're done with the big job. I feel like the cast and crew of Star Trek, they got to have a big, huge party when they finished season one, and I feel like you and I are in the same spot. It's time to have a big, huge party because we finished Season one of Star Trek, the original series. I, no, we just finished doing a podcast on season one of the original series. Stand corrected. They finished doing <laughs> the actual first season of the right. original series. But regardless, we did finish covering the first season of Star Trek. And I can't believe that we are already at this point. We are actually more than a third of the way through covering the original series because we covered 30 episodes during the first season, and that includes The Cage. So we have 50 episodes to go, and if these 30 went fast, I feel like I want to slow down because I don't want want this to end. Well, I feel like we need to slow down, too, because it's been a lot of editing. (laughs) (laughs) I'll tell you when we started, because I do the cinephiles, and the cinephiles, we do in movies, and frequently those get broken into two or three parts because they got longer and longer and longer. And when we started doing Star Trek, I went, well, these episodes are never going to be as long. I mean, we're talking about a show. It's, every show is less than an hour. It's not a two-hour movie. Plus, it's the same characters, the same location, same situation every time. I figure episodes are going to be an hour and 15, yeah. an hour and a half tops. That is not what ended up happening. <laughs> no, not at all. In fact, City on the Edge of Forever, as of now, is our longest episode of Enterprise Incidents. It was like two hours and 47 minutes. Yeah. But It flew by because it was such an engaging, deep, revelatory conversation. And uh, I I just am so proud of every single conversation we had throughout the course of season one of Enterprise Incidents. I am too. Yeah. It it, it, it really, and, and I have to say for everyone listening, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for, for joining us on the voyages of the Starship Enterprise incidents and for for following along with us and rediscovering the original series. And for many people, and I would say ourselves included, giving us a whole new reason to love the original series more than we ever did. Well, I think something interesting happened for both of us when we looked at this show that we watched a million times and said, wait, wait, Let's stop and actually look at it really, really seriously and see what we see. And the result was, man, we discovered it was a whole other show. There was, the show that I thought I knew backwards and forwards is actually a whole other show there that I hadn't seen before. And that, you know what, that is a really, really great point, Steve, because when we first started doing this, that was not the plan. But what's amazing is how quickly Enterprise Incidents really found its voice. When we realize, and we realize this really early on, that this standalone series, episode by episode, each episode stands on its own, which is why they were able to air it out of the order from when they actually filmed it. But when you when you rewatch it in production order, you realize that even though it wasn't intended to be linked, it actually links together easily and brilliantly and it makes so much sense and that discovery that the original series is actually a serialized show has made you and me and everyone listening see it in a whole new light well i think what's you you know the the, there's the term confirmation bias in science and what it means is that i have a an idea i have a theory and i look out at a whole bunch of information and all the information that proves my theory pops out at me and all the information that disproves my theory for some reason i don't notice and that is a very common human thing that's how we all look at the world and yes 100% 100% us finding continuity in Star Trek is a total example of confirmation bias. We are looking for a thing and so we end up finding it. And so, and uh, you know, we're, we're going to say it today. We'll say it in every episode down the line. They didn't plan this. We're not trying to say that this was in the show. But the big thing to me is like, f- for me at least as we've done this, is I've gone, well, does thinking of it in terms of continuity make the show better? And the answer is mostly maybe just through a lot of luck that it happens to work. It really does. Oh, it it makes the show so much better, which is which I didn't <laughs> I gotta tell you, after all these decades of of devouring 
the series itself and reading everything I could about it, I didn't think that was possible. But it absolutely makes it better because, like you said, it was not intended. You know, the producers and the writers didn't sit down no, with plans to not. link it at all. But the fact that it does link so easily is a testament to how brilliant the show actually is and how the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Yeah, I, that's that's one of the other big things is is when we talked about Errand of Mercy and we talked about some of the other and we're looking at these themes and it, in a weird way, it's how they contradict that actually makes it bigger than the sum of the parts. And there was something I was thinking about. Uh, I'm just editing our final episode of season one, Operation Annihilate. And there's the, the great interactions between Kirk, Spock and McCoy, and all of them are wrong. And what I realized is that's very similar to what we've been talking about, about the show is that in general, is that it's not that it's right. It's not that Kirk is right. It's that they're all human and they can all learn. And that this is a dynamic situation where they all, you know, it's like Kirk, uh, unlike any other show I can think of, Kirk literally can't succeed without McCoy and Spock. Absolutely. You know, and because he's not right and McCoy is not right and Spock is not right. All three of them are regularly wrong and all three of them are willing to learn. And that's the dynamics and the same, you know, going back to the macro level of the episodes, it's not that each episode is like, this is the truth. It's that this is a piece of the truth and this is something to think about and how does it conflict with this other one and what does that make you think of? Yeah, it's a deep, that's why this is a deep show. You know, I, I, one of the things I always loved about the, about Star Trek is actually the thing that people misunderstand about Star Trek. And so many people have sort of looked at Star Trek, all of the shows, not just the original series, about uh, as, as being the, the perfection of humanity. Yeah. And it was never about the perfection of it. It was about the striving for greatness, the striving to, to get there. I mean, we're never going to get there. But what I realized is that more often than I, than I really suspected that Kirk especially was wrong yeah. and that he learned. I mean, all of them learned, but especially Kirk. And we're not even in, in, in season two yet, but that's, that's just one of the, the many revelations that I know that I've had and I know you have had as well that have, has made this show resonate deeper. It has made my love for the show even greater than I thought it could possibly be. So by the time we got to the end of the first season, with all of the episodes that went over budget, when you mm. add it all up, Steve, mm. season one finished $150,000 in the red. And this was a show that for the first half of the first season cost about 193500 and then uh, it went down to 185000 Well, that's really interesting. So if it's $150,000 over budget for the season... That means that, because I just pulled out my calculator, because you know I like numbers and math, <laughs> and that means it averages $5,000 over per episode. Mm -hmm. And that means if the, let's say that the the budget was, let's say it was 190 or to be an average. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right, so that means. <laughs> He's doing his math, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, I'm doing math. That means that it was an average of, oh, I did it the wrong way. Uh, oh, it's an average of 2% over budget. 2%. 2.5% over budget per episode. That's actually not that bad. Exactly. I don't think that's that bad at all. And considering that the, nothing like this had ever been done, yeah. I mean, that's the other perspective that, that looking back on the production side of it is like before Star Trek, nothing like that had ever been done. It had just been maybe a year or two before that, that television started, started broadcasting in color, for crying out loud. But here's the thing. By the end of the first season, Star Trek was nominated for five Emmys. Mm. Five Emmys, including Outstanding Dramatic Series. Star Trek is the very first series to be nominated, a science fiction series, to be nominated for an Emmy. And on the date of June 4th, 1967, uh, the 19th Emmy Awards, so Star Trek was nominated for Outstanding Dramatic Series, Outstanding Supporting Actor for Leonard Nimoy. Hmm. He was nominated for Supporting Actor all three seasons. He was also nominated for Individual Achievements in Cinematography and Photographic Effects. Totally deserved. 
totally deserved individual achievements in art direction and ally crafts, mechanical special effects, and individual achievements in film and sound editing. Guess how many Emmys it won that year? Based on your tone, I will say zero. Zero. So when Star Trek was nominated for Outstanding Dramatic Series, do you know what beat it? Uh, So this is 1966-67. I'm going to go with Mission Impossible. You are correct. We got a pot of wine (laughs) across the stream. So yes, Mission Impossible was the winner for Best Dramatic Series. So while Star Trek didn't win... You know who else won that night was Desilu, of because course, Desilu yeah. produced both Star Trek and Mission Impossible, two shows that premiered in 1966, two shows that went over budget, two shows that were way ahead of their time, and two shows that are still inspiring new material to this day. So the fact that Mission Impossible won, okay, so the producers of Star Trek didn't uh, have the greatest night coming home with any Emmys, but Lucille Ball's Desilu certainly did, and Lucille Ball also won an Emmy for playing Lucy on The Lucy Show. So Desilu had a really good night. You know, it was funny, and I I, I realized, I I wish I had looked this up before and again gotten more numbers, but I was trying to look up what the actual ratings uh, were of Star Trek in that first season. And it looks like, you know, in generally, it was in second or third place on the night, which you think about back when there are three networks, that means that 20 or 30% of the televisions in America were tuned into Star Trek. And I just want to point out, again, I didn't go to get the numbers, but that is, I guarantee you, more people than watch anything on TV today. Well, first of all, for for many decades, it was a myth that Star Trek didn't do well in the ratings. And it's like that line from the man who shot Liberty Valance. When the legend becomes fact, print the legend. The legend is that Star Trek was a disaster in the ratings. And you are absolutely right. Star Trek was not a disaster. It, It may not have been the number one show, but it still did very, very strong. And in Mark Cushman's books, the three volume these are the voyages series the actual ratings were were printed for the very first time on an episode by episode basis and star trek was oftentimes the number one show on the network for the night right and certainly and this is something that they didn't realize at the time for its demo for its target audience right. it was huge So, of course, everybody knows the famous letter-writing campaign at the end of the second season that brought Star Trek back for the third season. But there was actually a letter-writing campaign Mm. in the first season that helped bring Star Trek back for a second season. It just wasn't as uh, famous as the one that B. Joe Trimble uh, and John Trimble spearheaded for the third season. But the letter-writing campaign was spearheaded by a group called The Committee. Hmm. And can you guess which famous science fiction writer and a writer of a Star Trek episode was sort of like the head of the committee? I cannot. I'm going to tell you, it's Harlan Ellison. I, you know, it's so funny because that was the first thing that popped in my head. But then I went, after what happened on City in the Edge of Forever, he's part of the letter writing campaign to keep Star Trek on the air? Well, well, by the time all those problems started happening with the rewrites that went into City on the Edge of Forever, uh, I mean, certainly Harlan Ellison was very disillusioned after that fact. But before that got into anything, uh, before that, that there turned into the ugly and never resolved issue that it was, sadly, Yes, it was Harlan Ellison, along with Frank Herbert, Mm. Richard Matheson, who wrote The Enemy Within, Robert Block, who wrote What a Little Girl's Made Of, and season two's Cat's Ball, Theodore Sturgeon, who wrote The Shore Leave and A Mock Time, uh, uh, and a few others drafted a letter asking people to keep uh, Star Trek on NBC. You know what's funny? (laughs) It actually, even though I wouldn't have guessed it about Harlan Ellison, now that you say it, it, maybe that explains something, because you don't, you can't hate something with so much passion unless at first you loved it. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? That's a really good I point. I think he, maybe he was really connected to Star Trek, really adored it, and then felt completely betrayed by it. Yep. And that's part of why he was so angry and held so much animosity for so long. 
So we covered 30 episodes of Star Trek for season one of Enterprise Incidents. Again, that does include The Cage, which never aired officially until the 80s. Uh, but there, I mean, of course, there were 29 episodes that aired, but there were actually 48 story assignments given out for the first season. So there were a bunch of stories there that never got past like the outline stage or the a first draft teleplay stage that never mm. saw the light of day. And if you want to read what those uh, never produced story assignments were, I highly recommend Mark Cushman's These Are the Voyages, Volume 1, which has breakdowns and, and story wow. descriptions of a lot of these episodes. And, you know, there are a couple in there that I go, hmm, that that would have been really interesting to see. You know, there's a uh, an, an episode title called Portrait in Black and White that is about racism. Mm. That makes me think of Let That Be Your Last sure. Battlefield, but it's nothing like Let That Be Your Last Battlefield. And as that story was was being developed, NBC actually felt that it was too it was too much of a hot button for for Star Trek or any show on network television should touch. But I definitely recommend reading, uh, I mean, the the uh, Mark Cushman books are, are essential reads and have really given me a lot of uh, research material <laughs> yeah. for this podcast. Yeah, I, I think I'm sure there's many things that we w I would never have gotten to learn from you if you hadn't learned them from the Mark Cushman books. I'm curious about, you know, we've gone on this journey together. What do you feel were, what were your biggest discoveries along the way? In season one, I, I got to tell you, when I think of like the the big mind blowing, because there are so many, there are so many times where you and I were sitting across from each other, uh, either in person or in the beginning, you know, over the Zoom, where where you would say something and you blow my mind, and and there's definitely an episode where you really rocked my world with that, but. I remember when we were doing our deep dive with uh, Ralph Sinetsky, the yeah. director of This Side of Paradise, and we were talking about when uh, Kirk and Sulu and the other crewmen were walking over to Spock hanging on the tree. Uh, Kelowitz uh, was the third guy. Mm -hmm. And the, the plant shot the spores, and Kelowitz and Sulu got infected, but Kirk didn't, even though he was only a few feet behind them. And when Ralph Sinetsky said that Kirk did not get infected because he was angry. I remember you and I just went, oh my God, whoa, what? Whoa. <laughs> yeah, that, that, well, I mean, that's, that one in particular, because it's hearing it from the dude. Yeah, you know the what man I mean? Who directed it, yeah. I mean, fr frankly, listening to Ralph Sinensky talk us through the shooting of that episode was, you know, it's a high, I've now done a few hundred podcasts, and that is one of the great highlights of doing podcasts. What, what's, what, are, what's one of the things uh, for you that, 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 Blew your mind. Well, I think, I mean, obviously just the general idea of continuity is 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 one, but I think the the bigger one is I thought I knew who James T. Kirk was and I didn't. Mm -hmm. Is that he was very different. And we're gonna go into a lot of detail in another supplemental episode um, where you get to hear actually our big presentation that we did in Vegas. So you get to hear our live show, and that's coming up. So I won't go into details on it, but I thought that he was just this studly, tough, confident guy. Mm -hmm. And I now know that he wasn't. And the thing that's just come up most recently with City on the Edge of Forever and Operation Annihilate, he's a tragic figure. Mm -hmm. Like he is mm -hmm. a person who has dealt with more loss than I ever, and because he shakes it off and he goes on, because that's what Captain Kirk does, I don't think I felt the depth of the pain that this and the sacrifices this guy has made, and they are huge. And also the conscience of the king. Absolutely. Because I mean, in addition to sitting on the edge of forever, and definitely Operation Annihilate. I mean, I mean, all the emotional suffering that Kirk went through and all the physical suffering that Spock went through yeah. in Operation Annihilate. But you're right, like in terms of 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 seeing the series as serialized and linking everything together, the and, and Conscience of the King, Steve, as you know, is one of my my favorite episodes of them all and sort of just seeing how the trauma that Kirk experienced on Tarsus 4 had a ripple effect on his life and his career was 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 definitely a, a big one of the many revelations uh, that came up during these yeah. discussions yeah absolutely the other I have to say uh, is as you know because I we talked about this in other episodes Miri Okay, mm. with Kim Darby is not an episode that I ever held in such high praise. I always liked it, but it's not one that I rewatched very much. But our discussion during that episode, where 
first of all, rewatching that episode after the uh, a global pandemic, right. which we're still sort of working through, yep. that was a sort of mind-blowing experience to see how this episode that was filmed in 1966 is, res- is resonating so much deeper uh, as we recorded that episode in 2021. But the other, the other big revelation, I know that we discussed the parallels between What Are Little Girls Made Of and Blade Runner, mm. which is a movie that we discussed on The Cinephiles. Yeah. I know that we discussed those parallels during the recording of that episode of Enterprise Incidents, but it was actually something that a listener posted right. on our Facebook page that blew our mind, which was, I can't believe you guys didn't connect the two scenes where Deckard and Kirk are hanging from a ledge and they are saved by these two replicants, so to speak, who ultimately perish. Yep. That blew my mind. Absolutely. Well, there have been several things from our uh, listeners that we've seen on Facebook or on Twitter or on YouTube that have been just amazing additions. And one of them, we have a listener who uh, served for years as an officer in the Navy. And so he's given us insight into naval rank and naval procedure and how that relates to what's happening on the Enterprise. We've had other people who, you know, actually, you know, remember watching the show with their families and are talking about their experiences as kids watching these things. I mean, there have been so much that because that one of the most interesting things for me going from the difference between the cinephiles and doing this is that we're surrounded by thousands of Star Trek experts you know millions. and they <laughs> millions <laughs> yeah. and they are very very eager to contribute to this conversation and so i every every day i go on to social media and i'm learning things that i didn't know before which is great and again you know to everyone who has been with us every step of this way and to everyone who discovered us along the way and went back to the beginning and and binged on enterprise incidents i can't tell you how grateful we are for your support for your amazing reviews for your comments on youtube for your comments on facebook and definitely for your reviews on Apple. Apple Podcasts. Yes, that is a hint. If you are listening to us right now, make sure you review Enterprise Incidents on Apple Podcasts because that is how we sort of like stay in the uh, the, the mix and the running and other people can find us. Um, one of the things I want to mention, just going back to Miri, one of the themes that has come up is how is the older generation talking to the younger generation? And, and that you can see so many of the episodes, whether it's Miri or This Side of Paradise or even things like Return of the Archons and where there's these ideas that the older generation, the World War II generation is talking to the baby boomer generation, the 60s generation. And what I think is so much more interesting and subtle than I ever saw before is that they're not just, there are times where they're condemning it, like they are in Miri, and saying, hey, this is not gonna work out the way you want. But there are other times where the feelings are very mixed, like this side of paradise. And there's the great line that we talked about just recently in City on the Edge of Forever, where they talk about Edith Keeler, who is the peace person, and say, she was right, but at at the the wrong wrong time. time. And that is such a subtle thing, because it's not, because again, the Star Trek audience is a younger generation. They're not saying, you guys who are talking in the peace movement, you're stupid, you're wrong. They're not saying that. They're saying, you're right. But be careful. Be careful of this other thing. Absolutely. That is a much more sophisticated way of thinking about this stuff than I had ever seen before. You know, one of the things that we talked about, and, and again, this is this the fact that we discovered this along the way, Steve, the fact that we 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 had this major epiphany so and again this happened early early on say so we we were able to draw these connections as as our podcast series went along was was how episodes like naked time enemy within conscience of the king galileo 7 and others contributed to later episodes and without without question i mean the biggest the biggest revelation of that is in the character like you said of james t kirk uh the fact that he <laughs> Definitely that, that that stack of books with legs comment from just where, a throwaway line in the second pilot <laughs> yeah, has has paid off uh, because we've seen that uh, we, we've seen that uh, like manifest itself. We've seen that we've seen that comment fully realized like in arena in the alternative factor oh, in yeah, all, right. there are all sorts of epic in when he talks about um, Milton in Spacey. There's so many times where we see like, oh. Kirk clearly Kirk was knows a, his stuff. Yeah, he absolutely knows his stuff. But also, and this is something again that came. Uh, I don't know if this was 
part of, I, I, you know, I never knew if this was like something that you figured out while you were prepping for our deep dive or if it was something that came out during the conversation. But Galileo 7 is an episode, I, I mean, I, it's solid. I've liked it. Not my favorite. It's flawed. It definitely has its flaws. But the examination of that episode, that it is an examination of command and, and, and two Two different right, two perspectives parallels, yeah. on command, one from a logical point of view, one from an emotional point of view. And just seeing Spock make all those mistakes from a logical point of view in that episode, and there were mistakes that he never he never made again. Like like it's almost like he he learned from those mistakes. Because like when you watch Galileo 7, when you see the way he, t- he treats the crew uh, in, in such an insensitive manner and just makes bad choices, but then the next time you really see him take command, which was in the beginning of Squire of Gothos, right. that he is like in charge, he knows what he's doing, and, and you know, he's... He's, he's open of, to other opinions, yep. he's, he knows that he doesn't know everything, he's bringing the crew in to, to, to join and work with him. Um, in answer to your question, it was totally in the prep. <laughs> like, oh, awesome. oh, no, I had written down, <laughs> I went through a couple of times and I was like, oh, there's that parallel. There's that parallel. Absolutely. No, I did. I did think that through. And the big thing, and I, I don't feel like I said it well in that episode, so I'm going to try to say it again. The biggest mistake I think Spock makes is that because he doesn't like emotions or want to have emotions, he believes that they don't exist. And emotions, a logical person to ignore emotions is illogical. People have them. They are real. Therefore, you can't ignore them, even though you don't personally want to have them, you know? So so I'm curious, like when you were prepping for that episode and you yes. started piecing together the things, did you think in your head, oh my God, I can't wait to talk about this? Of course. <laughs> yeah. Well, although, although I also have to say, I have to say like, you know, there have been, I've gone pretty far afield sometimes. And some of them I've gone... I don't know if Scott's going to go with me on this one. <laughs> and, and frankly, some of them in the editor- editing, I, I, I pulled them back because I was like, I went too far. I, I went way too far down that rabbit hole. Let's, let's, let's bring it back a little bit. But Miri, like when you were bringing up, what was that whole thing with the 80 year time cycle that you were it's, talking it's about? It's a theory. And I, now I don't have the author's name in front of me. It's uh, called the fourth turning. And there's two books. One is the fourth turning. One is called generations. And I'm going to say it again. I said it in that episode, Confirmation bias, like I said earlier today, full of it, cherry picking their data, absolutely. There's all sorts of things wrong with the theory, but it is chilling. Like it, it was chilling when you when you yeah. revealed that during the recording of that yeah. podcast. And and that was just such a the 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 conversation about that episode transcended the episode itself. And that is one of the reasons why my love for Star Trek in general has just grown exponentially throughout the course of these last six months of doing these deep dives with you because of revelations like that, because of things, you know, I mean, I've read everything. I have been watching the show religiously since, since 1974, you know, and, and for you and I, especially because yeah. of how old we are to be part of that syndication generation that really put Star Trek on the map and made it popular leading to the movies and the other shows. I, I know that we're really, really proud of that, but I just never thought that I would ever love Star Trek more than I, more than I did. And I feel a, that I do love it more than I ever did, but I also feel proud that you and I have found found something new, a new way of looking at the show that's never been done. I, I, I think, you know, part of it is you and I bring ourselves, mm-hmm. you know, like mm-hmm. I think that's one of the key, you know, I teach filmmaking, I teach writing is that if you can't bring your own soul and heart and perspective to the thing that you're creating, well, it's going to be pretty dry and that, you know, this is this is Scott and Steve. You know, there's a reason why it says Enterprise Incidents with Scott and Steve, because <laughs> yeah. it is our perspective. I want to say something else, too, uh, that I was thinking about. There, there's, again, this is something that I teach, but there's some stories that I call closed, which means that you get to the end and you're done. And there's some stories that remain open, which is you get to the end, but you continue to think about them. And there are great stories that are closed. Like you get to the end of Die Hard, you're not going, oh, what was that all about? I don't want to think about that. You go, totally. yes, that was great. <laughs> Star Trek so often is open. So, so often you get to the end of an episode and go, oh, you know, City on the Edge of Forever being the, the greatest example, but yep. but same with Balance of Terror, same with Where No Man Has Gone Before, same with Corbomite. There's Charlie X. Charlie X, oh my God, yes. Where you're going, oh, well, what does this mean? How mm-hmm. do I feel about this? What do I think? Charlie X. 
definitely an episode. Always loved it. Love it even more after that discussion. After after just seeing the tragedy, uh, the tragic way that that ends. And it was it was during that episode, Steve, during the conversation of that episode that you and I picked up on a a, a trait of Captain Kirk's that would play out in other episodes throughout the rest of the first season, if not the rest of the, of the original series. And that is the compassion. Yeah. So, so in Charlie X, how he wants to take the ship back from Charlie. And then at the last moment pleads or tries to reason with the Thasians to let Charlie stay yeah. in balance of terror. He's going after the Romulans. Yep. going to destroy the Romulans before they get to their home base or get past the neutral, uh, neutral zone. But then at the last minute offers to beam the survivors aboard Yep. in arena, arena. big yep. time devil you know. in the dark. Yep. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Well, here's what's crazy about this to me. And again, I'm going to, I'll keep saying it. They didn't plan this, but it is amazing. What is the most dramatic thing Kirk says in the pilot of all else, a God needs compassion. Of all else, a God needs compassion. Is that he highlights compassion as this, one of the most important traits in the pilot. Mm -hmm. And in the moment he's got the rock over Gary Mitchell and he's about, that's his moment of compassion. That's the moment where in arena, he doesn't kill the Gorn. That's the moment where he's face to face with the Horda and could shoot it and chooses not to. That's the moment at the end of Corbomite where he thinks he has the Viserys and could destroy it and says, go help it. They establish this idea about Kirk's, Kirk's character and the values of Star Trek in the pilot. That's amazing. That that is absolutely amazing. So, uh, in terms of like guest stars, yes. Okay, in terms of guest stars, who are like your top three? My top three guest stars. Hmm. Let me think about that. Are we are we including like the bad guys? Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. Well, number one is Khan. Mm, of course. I mean, yeah. I just, you, Ricardo Montalban. Even more so, watching. I mean, I always loved him watching this time. I'm like, holy crap, this guy is charismatic. Absolutely love Khan. I love Commander Core. Uh, I'm trying to think of who would be my third one. Who, who are yours? Okay, well, uh, obviously Khan. Yeah. Uh, just because, I, I mean, with, without the Khan character, without actually Ricardo Montalban playing him, I mean, Ricardo Montalban, I, th I felt like, I always liked I the figured episode. Out my, I figured out my third, okay, by the way. Okay, who's your third? Samuel T. Cogley. So He's great! Yeah. He's so great. That speech he gives about it's the, the Magna Carta, the Constitution, <laughs> the fundamental declaration of the Martian colonies, the statutes of Alpha 3. Oh, God. No, you know what? It's like I'm recording that episode, by the way, with Dave Ross. Oh, it's great. That was he was our first guest star. Yep. And 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 he was so great to he felt I felt like he was part of the team for totally. sure because of all the knowledge he brought and the energy. But so, so you know, I I do I know how you feel about this episode. You're going to say Trelane. Yes, I am. You can love Trelane. It's fine. I love Trelane. I love Trelane. I love William Campbell's performance as Trelane. And, and I feel like even though Squire of Gothos is not like in you know, a top 10 great, sure. it is one of my favorites because, and I realized this while we were recording that episode because it was a seamless blend in tone that you have. You have Trelane, you have William Campbell giving this fun, playful performance, but then you have the Enterprise crew, you know, Kirk and Spock, and, you know, they're playing it straight, but yet it works. And the chemistry between the two Williams, they're Shatner, clearly having a lot of fun. They're so, they're clearly having a lot of fun. And that fun is infectious, if I can use that word during a pandemic. But that that's an episode I've always loved. I've, I've loved it even more. And I just think that William Campbell, he's, having so much fun. He's so committed. He's so committed in his performance as Trelane. But also the thing, the revelation that I got through that episode was how it is actually an anti-war episode hmm. because the way Trelane is so fixated on, on human history, on the violent side right. of human history, the conflict, he's like bragging about uh, like, 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 oh, doesn't it make your blood run swiftly, Captain, seeing people march off to their deaths? And, you know, you think it's just kind of like, oh, this guy's got a weird hobby. But, like, he's picking up on a very dark side of humanity that continues to plague and, ha and haunt humanity. And, and, and I see that now as an anti-war episode written by Paul Schneider. So one of the things that I think is really interesting, and Squire Gothos is a great example, is if you looked at all the other television— Perry Mason was always doing Perry Mason. He was always the same. It was always a serious show. It always had the same tone. 
Gilligan, you know, Bob Denver on Gilligan's <laughs> Island, it never got serious. It was always the same. It was always silly. Yes, maybe in a show like The Twilight Zone, which is an anthology, you might have a comedy show and a scary show and a dramatic show. But look at our first season of Star Trek. We have had really, really heavy, serious stuff. Absolutely. We have had really scary stuff. We've had silly stuff. And, and so you get to, and so Shatner, Shatner in particular, had to look at this part and go, look at all the stuff I get to do. Exactly. I get to be the badass commander fighting the Romulan commander in Balance of Terror. I get to go toe to toe with Khan. I get to joke back and forth with Harry Mudd and with Trelane. I get to go, you know, physical fighting stuff. And I get to kiss all the pretty girls. Like, it's the <laughs> biggest range of a, of, of a show in terms of tone. I don't think anything's like that. Yeah, that's a really, really good point. And when you get to, when you get to an episode like Tomorrow Was Yesterday... Or the Squire of Gothos, where where you really you know lean into that mm -hmm. and go, oh, this this is this is, we can do this yeah. and still make it feel like Star Trek, and that's why that opened the door for episodes like Trouble with Tribbles and I Mud and the right. piece of the action in the second season. The the other big revelation, and I've always said this, and I know I said this while we were in the process of doing our our, our season here, but this podcast has made me really appreciate the contributions of writer, producer, showrunner, Gene Kuhn. Of course. Even more. Because, first of all, he wrote some of the finest episodes of the entire series. Second of all, the way he, he defined that dynamic between Kirk, Spock, and McCoy. Third, because some of those screenplays that he wrote were definite messages and allegories. Yes. Specifically, a taste of Armageddon yeah. and Arena and Devil and the well, not Devil in the Dark so much uh, as a as a message about war, but Errant of Mercy, big time. Yeah, um, I have a question for you. Yeah. So you asked me who my favorite guest star was. Mm -hmm. Who is your favorite guest crew member? Is it? You know, we have Riley, we have Bailey, we have Styles, we have DeSalle, we have Doctor Daner. Who is your favorite guest crew member? Well, when you say favorite, I, I'm going to take that to mean. The character that I was really fascinated by. And I'm going to go with Styles. Yeah. The reason I'm going with Styles, what the heck, how did this guy get to the bridge of the Enterprise being as, as bigoted as he was? How did he get that far where he was a senior officer on the Enterprise to be on the bridge? Uh, Paul Comey's performance in that episode was terrific, that he, he was so blinded. By his his bigotry, that and it's the fact that Kirk let him stay on the bridge, even though he like I love that scene when he swings his chair around and says, mm -hmm. "Leave any bigotry in your quarters. There's no room for it here on the bridge." But what fascinated me is by the, by the end of the episode when Spock saves him, and he goes, uh, "If I had if I hadn't been for Mister Spock," and Spock goes, "I just saved an officer yeah. from performing their so they can perform their duty. It was the logical thing to do," but. I would love to have seen Paul Comey at least as a recurring character as Styles because that kind of bigotry and and intolerance doesn't just go away like that. I would like to have seen that further tested because I think that would have been a way for for the series to hold a mirror up to society, especially in the 60s. So first of all, I couldn't agree more. I think he's great. I think the actor is great. And I think what's so important about his character and as an actor is that you cannot play a bad guy. That's not a good idea for an actor in general. In general, you have to play someone who's completely right. He is a really good, he's a hero in his mind mm -hmm. because he has seen who the bad guy is. This is a threat to the entire Federation if this guy is a spy. He doesn't know that he has this bias and so he's a hero in his mind. That's the first thing. The second thing, why well, I won't say I think it's great that this bigoted guy ended up on the bridge of the Enterprise in the Star Trek world. I think it's great that this bigoted guy ended up on the bridge of the Enterprise in the TV world. Mm -hmm. Because, And here's the mm -hmm. thing. And we're seeing this all the time in the military in the, that there are all these stories that you find out of a certain belief system of someone who might have been fairly high up in the military. And I don't want to get political in it. But the fact is, why would anyone notice that Styles had this opinion until it came up? He's a great officer. He's responsible. He does his job. He could be funny. He could be charismatic, a good friend to everybody. It's only when this thing comes up that you find out. And the thing is, again... 
this is the the crew of this enterprise in the original series they're flawed you know i think you know we you know we talk about this perfectionism thing if you're more perfect then you only find the flaws elsewhere and then you're right and they're wrong it's that's not nearly as dramatic as oh the flaws are in us who's what's another character that you think also, uh, uh, in terms of being a crew member, that you would like to have seen more of, I think Riley fits in great. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think mm-hmm. I think he fits in great. I think he he totally could have seen more of. I think I don't love Doctor Danner, but she ends up being a real hero uh, in the course of that yeah, episode. She does. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, there was another one who I just love. Oh, Boma. Oh, Boma. Yes, absolutely, <laughs> Boma. Like, first of all, he should have been court martial for uh, insurrection after, after the way he treated Spock. But they, they, they were talking. I remember when we did our discussion of Galileo 7 that, that they were kind of thinking of, of having Boma be a recurring character, but, but it just didn't happen. Yeah. Who is the character that of, of our regular crew who was most surprising to you? Well, obviously, in addition to Captain Kirk, because right. Kirk is the one that, that you know we've had so many revelations right. about. With regards to being a tragic, tragic hero, and 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 certainly a lot more book, a lot book smarter than, than probably ever gave him credit for, but I really was, as we were talking about each episode that had Sulu in it. Yeah. You know, we would say, "Wow, you know, Sulu really played a much bigger part in the first season than he's probably given credit for." I mean, obviously. In an episode of like, you know, Naked Time, he definitely had a prominent role, though not necessarily for the better. But then in like Tomorrow's Yesterday, when he had the foresight to yeah. beam back up to the Enterprise with the footage that they, they went down there for to get of the uh, of the Air Force pilot shooting the Enterprise. Um, and uh, I, I think, you know, he also took command in mm-hmm. Arena and in Errand of Mercy. Mm-hmm. And I think that Sulu... Uh, definitely went way, way up in my... I mean, I've always liked the character, and I think George Takei is awesome, but he really had a, a much, much bigger part in the in the uh, dynamic of the senior officers. Well, and think about how much you know about... He's my choice, too, and think about how much we know about him. He He's into botany. He's into fencing, not with a katana, but with a with a with a rapier. You know that that tells us something. We find out that he's into antiques because he finds the gun in shore leave. They give all these little details of like, oh, this is this this is an interesting guy. And even when we see in the brief and naked time his relationship with Riley, we're like, oh, this guy has strong opinions. He's charismatic. He has you know a lot of drive. He's He's peculiar in a way. Yeah, they put more time developing him than I than I had ever really noticed before. Really, I mean, they put way more time developing him than they do Scotty or they do even even McCoy to some degree until we get into it a little further when they really start to develop like, his like character. I, I love the scene in the briefing room in in uh, Balance of Terror when Styles is saying we have to attack. You know, yeah. Sulu jumps in, attack with what? You yeah. know, like we can't see him. Like, yeah, exactly. But here's the other thing, you know, like when thinking about the great villains or antagonists, I forgot to mention the Romulan commander. Oh, yeah, absolutely. 100%. Romulan commander who doesn't have a name, played by Mark Leonard. But I mean, that episode, I remember when we recorded that. We were very excited because we both really, really, really love that episode. It's one of our most listened to episodes of Enterprise Incidents, and for good reason. It is a masterpiece episode. But I love how these guys are in each other's heads. They respect each other. That last moment, uh, you know, I, in a different reality, I could have called you friend. It is Star Trek at its really at its finest. And, and the other thing about Where No Man Has Gone Before and Gary Mitchell is even though Gary perished at the end of that episode, I have to say that to get through the entire first season and to do our, our deep dives and, and have certain episodes really come out even better than we expected, the fact that Where No Man Has Gone Before, which was a pilot episode, which effectively sold the series and effectively introduced William Shatner as James R. Kirk, soon to be James T. Kirk, that episode, Where No Man Has Gone Before, it's just a great Star Trek episode. And that that it still is is a, uh, a still a, there's a bar there that where no man has gone before has and and the other thing about the the first season as a whole is that it is without question the first season of the original series 
is the very best first season of any Star Trek show we've seen over these last 55 years. 100%. I, I, and, and I'm sure the people out there disagree. I'm, you know, everyone is, and you're entitled to your opinion, and that's fantastic. And whatever you like is great. That's great that you like that. But yeah, I, <laughs> I, I totally agree. I, I Just on where No Man Has Gone Before, I think they prove this thing, which is that we can have a show that has real adventurous action moments, have a show that has genuinely scary moments, have a show and have a show that is about some really interesting and compelling ideas and all wrap it up in under an hour. I mean, it's it's an impressive piece of television. When it, when it comes to like there are so many great moments in terms of uh, dramatic moments, but there are also great moments of heart, but really genuinely moving moments. Like what are some of the most moving moments throughout the first season that really stick out to you? The one that hit me the hardest is Naked Time. When I, um, when I think of you as my friend, I'm ashamed. That, that moment rocked me. I, I, you know, you brought that up quite a bit. Yeah. What was it about that moment that rocked you? Because it's so painful for Spock is that what it says is that this is a really messed up person. This is a person who feels these tremendous emotions and the, the love, the most positive emotions he can feel about the most positive relationship in his life fills him with shame. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, I mean, mm -hmm. that is such a, talk about we haven't perfected ourselves. I mean, that is such a painful thing. And I, and I think too, as an emotionally reserved person, you know, who sometimes struggles with like, how do I, express the things that I want to express that that made sense to me like the the I think you know we live in this sort of post therapy post express your feelings age but expressing your feelings isn't always that easy you know it can be really really hard you know I remember I remember one time this is years and years ago um uh and it was like work stuff and I had to go to my wife and say I'm not happy and that saying those three words or um was really, really hard. Uh, I understand. You know, ex ex sometimes expressing your emotion. And so then I go to, here's this character who's a hero of mine, and he is struggling. And, and what that means is, is that how many times a day does he feel friendship for James Kirk? Therefore, how many times a day does Mr. Spock feel ashamed? But he, he, that comment, but when you see the way that, that the friendship, not just between Kirk and Spock, yeah. but McCoy, Kirk, Spock, and McCoy, when you see the way that friendship has been had been strengthened, yeah, and ultimately tested, the way it was tested in sitting on the edge of forever. Literally, it's just going to bring this up. Go, okay. go ahead. Okay, but but the fact so you have that comment where where Spock tells Kirk, "When I feel friendship for you, I'm ashamed." But in in an episode like The Enemy Within, okay, which is a damn fine episode, uh, uh, yeah, one of the very very best, and it's such a well acted episode. The scene in the sick bay when Spock is logically analyzing the situation, right. we have a chance to examine good and evil in a man. Yeah. And then he stops himself and says, if I seem insensitive to what you're going through, understand it's the way I am. Like that was one of the first real moments where you see that there is there actually is a deep friendship there between them. But then in What Are World Girls Made Of, at the end of the episode, when Spock calls out Kirk for saying mm -hmm. The use, use your use of the word half breed, uh, like that hurt Spock's feelings. Yeah, you know, and then in definitely the menagerie, the amount of betrayal. Yeah, that Kirk felt from not just his first officer, but someone who's supposed to be his friend. You know, Spock's loyalties are completely tested in there. And then episode like you know uh, the side of paradise. Yeah. boy, is their friendship tested in there. Yeah. And that's really moving, too. I, I want to ask you a question. So we have this moment that was so profound to me. When I feel friendship for you, I feel ashamed. By the time we're in City on the Edge of Forever, and he's talking to Kirk about Edith Keeler, does he still feel ashamed of his friendship? No, absolutely not. I don't think so either. And again, this is this idea of continuity, but I don't think, he, I don't think Spock is the same person at this point. That's a great point. And you know, one of the moments where, uh, ultimately before you get to the end of the episode, where Kirk stops McCoy and McCoy says, do you know what you just did? And Spock says, he knows, doctor, he knows. When they are looking at Spock's tricorder, okay, after he's fixed it, after he's fixed the, uh, uh, with, with the stone knives and the bear skins, yeah. and they're able to ascertain, they're looking at images from Nazi Germany, 
And Spock makes the comment. He says, with the A-bombs and the V-2 rockets to carry them, yeah. Germany captured the world. And then he says, we must stop him, Jim. Not Captain. Yep. He says, Jim. And moments like that, uh, where he lets down his guard and he refers to him as Jim. I mean, it was such a subtle moment that I never really, I never really appreciated before. But this really detailed and analytical look at these shows and tying them together, like suddenly that moment popped right out to me that there is this real genuine friendship between these two people. 100%. By the way, the Captain versus Jim, Mr. Spock versus Spock, Doctor versus McCoy versus Dr. McCoy versus Bones, it's come up over and over again. And I think the show does an incredibly good job of having it mean something. Like when after Spock has been blinded in Operation Annihilate and Kirk calls down to Bones, who feels terrible, he uh, McCoy says, Captain. He doesn't say Jim. You know, in, in, in all the way back in Man Trap, there are times where Kirk calls him Dr. McCoy and there are times where he calls him Bones and there are times where Bones calls him Jim and times where he calls him Captain. And every one of them makes sense. Um, but Scott, I've given you some my most moving moment. What's your most moving moment? Both of my most moving moments from the first season of the original series come from this side of paradise. First of all, that episode is really special. Yeah. It is a, it's a sensitive episode. I love the location shooting. No other episode of, the, of the, certainly the first season or I think uh, any episode of the original show looks, looks and feels like this side of paradise. And the moment when Kirk is on the bridge alone after everyone left to join the colony on Omicron SETI Free and he is, yeah. he is sitting in the captain's chair and then he moves over to the helm station and he says, I'm beginning to realize how big this ship really is and how quiet. And he realizes that it, it's not the Enterprise that sustains his identity. Right. It's the crew of the Enterprise that sustains his identity. It may seem like, well, of course it's the crew. But no, it really is the crew. Without his crew, who is James T. Kirk? Yeah. But just that sense of he was, he was so abandoned and, and so defeated until yeah. you know he gets shot by the spores, but the other, the other moving moment uh, is also from the side of paradise, and it's in the transporter room yeah. between Spock and Layla. Yeah, and it is some of the finest acting at all in in the in the show, and you know Joe Ireland and Leonard Nimoy are so great, and I love the way Ralph Sinensky shot that when he's beaming. When he's beaming Layla Colomi aboard the Enterprise, you know, normally you'd see her materialize right. on the transporter platform. But you see the look on Spock's face while he's beaming her aboard, and you just you realize he's just going like, Oh, this is this is not this is gonna hurt. You know, yeah. not just her, but it's gonna hurt me too. Yep. And the 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 the, the line about self made purgatories It's poetic. Yeah. I mean Dorothy Fontana just wrote a beautiful, beautiful episode. And then, of course, I don't care how many times I watch City on the Edge of Agreed. Forever. That moment at the end with, with uh, Kirk stopping McCoy, Spock saying he knows Doctor. Then they go back through the portal. And the look on Kirk's face, he's not looking at anybody. He's just looking off into the distance with his jaw clenched, with a look of absolute pain and anguish on his face. And the body language of Scotty and Uhura. They're so excited that they made them. Yeah. They're, they're back. The yeah. Enterprise is back up there. Saved the universe. You saved it. But they look at Kirk and they yeah. realize something is wrong. Yeah. And the way Kirk says, let's get the hell out of here. And he doesn't, it's not with this forceful, let's get the hell out of here. It's like he can barely say it above a whisper because he, he's going to burst into tears. Yeah. Scott, who is... Throughout the first season, your favorite love interest. And you certainly can answer Edith Keeler, but if it's Edith Keeler, you have to give me a second one, too. My favorite love interest. Yes. From the first season. Yes. You ready for this? I am. The Enterprise. Damn, Scott. That was, that's really good. You like that? Yeah, I like what you did there. Okay. Smart. My favorite love interest is the Enterprise. Yes. And when you see the naked time, and when you see this side of paradise, yep. you realize 
how much Kirk loves the Enterprise. Yep. And again, the Enterprise meaning the ship and its crew, but the 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 desperation, like you said, he said, when he's infected by the disease in the nick of time, and he's and he says, "Never lose you, never." Oh yeah. So great. And then of course again the uh, the scene where he's alone on the bridge. Yeah. Um. But yeah, the Enterprise is the best love interest from season one. So I can't beat that answer. <laughs> What's yours? It's an excellent answer. Yeah. My answer is Layla Kalani. Oh, 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 great. Because it reveals, because uh, there are a whole bunch of love interests with Kirk and Edith Keeler, obviously the most profound one. But we don't learn much about Kirk by meeting Ruth or by meeting Ariel Shaw or me. But with Layla Kalani, you, she tells us more about Spock. And we learn more about who he is, and it is more emotional. It's it's the most emotional love interest other than Edith Keeler, in my opinion. Uh, I I mean I completely agree with that. Uh, and and again, Joe Irwin just gave just a, a, a magnificent performance. So so Steve, I, I'm curious that after we've recorded a conversation on a particular episode, did you go back to that episode and see it differently? Or are you asking no appreciation if, for it? Are you asking if I rewatched it or are you asking if I appreciated it differently? Both. So I have not rewatched a single episode since we started doing this. Okay. Um uh and I'm sure I will, and it'll be weird. Maybe, maybe at some point we're, we should do some of that and go, okay, I rewatched it and what was it like? I haven't done that. Um the biggest one that changed for me is because of you is Conscience of the King. Oh, I'm so happy to hear you say that. <laughs> yeah, that one. And, and, and part of it, because I really examined what was happening with Kirk, is I hadn't really examined it that much. And that made it way, way more interesting. Well, Steve, I have to confess. Yes. There are definitely a couple of episodes that after we recorded our deep dives, I went back and I rewatched. And, and most of those episodes are episodes that I watch on a regular basis all right. the time anyway, like Sitting on the Edge of Forever, like The Enemy Within, like Naked Time, like Squire Gothos. Yeah. Um, I know. I just happen to love Squire Gothos. And, 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 and I have to say that there is one episode that I rewatched because of a, that's That's actually the question. Yeah. Was, was were you... Were you motivated to rewatch an episode because of a conversation we had? And the answer to that is yes, there is one episode where I specifically went back to after a conversation we had. Can you mm. guess what it is? I have two guesses. Go My ahead. guess is probably Miri. No, it's. Uh, I'll, I, I okay. wanted to rewatch that, and I definitely held that in a much, much higher estimation, but it's not the episode that I specifically went back to and went, all right, let's see. Taste of Armageddon. Yes, sir. Yeah. It is a taste of Armageddon. And after rewatching it, because that was definitely... It was our most contentious episode, Contentious. Certainly. It was our most provocative conversation yeah. that, that we had. And that made it a fantastic conversation, I have yeah. to say. Uh, but after we talked, I went back uh, a couple weeks later, and, or a couple weeks ago, actually, and rewatched it with a fresh set of eyes and a new perspective after your perspective and the perspective of, of our guest on that show, Robert Burnett. Who's awesome. Another he person who's like oh, fantastic. He was fantastic. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. He's a great guy. Um, so <laughs> I absolutely see your points. And I absolutely see your point when it comes to Kirk's ordering of General Order 24. Yeah. For him to order the destruction of, a, of an entire planet, kill millions of people. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, a bluff, a gamble, a risk. It was all of those things. Yeah, sure, absolutely, it was absolutely, all of those things. And the 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 payoff of that episode is uh, McCoy saying, "You didn't know it would work." Yeah. And Spock saying, "You make me believe in luck." But yeah, I do have. I I I feel. I feel like I, I get it. I get your points much, much greater now than I ever, ever, ever did about like, well, that was, that was, uh, are you sure you want to do that? <laughs> you know, that was real. I was a little too far. I agree with that. Well, first of all, I appreciate that. And, and it, and it goes to show of like why we can keep going back to the show because there's more perspectives to, to look at. I think, because the thing is that we all agree that is a great episode of Star Trek. Yes, it is. It is really fun. It is the one episode that I do truly feel differently about it from doing our show than I, than I thought I would. 
Um, one thing, by the way, that I, I thought of after we recorded it, when I was editing it, the Enterprise wasn't in danger. They A, their shields work against the disruptors. Oh, the disruptors, yeah. But B, Scotty says, I went out of range. They could have just left. Oh, that's right. You're right. Yeah. At one point when they're like, uh, when, when Anon 7 says uh, open fire on the Enterprise again. It's like, no, it's out of range. says, no, it's out of range. The Enterprise just could have left. The Enterprise could have left. They, like, there was no force field holding him nope. in orbit around nope. Amini R7. There like, wasn't any uh, Landru who was like going to bring the ship down. Yep. There, they, they, it wasn't this side of paradise where if Kirk beams down, that's the end of the Enterprise. No, they all could have left. Oh, that's another episode. Return of the Archons. Ah. That, that, I mean, that's another episode that really went way, way up in yeah. my estimation. Me too. After our me too. That might be the one that went the most up. That for was me. a hell of a conversation. Yeah. I, I mean, I just... The, and, uh, you know, the whole... The scope of the episode with the, you know, the location shooting on the backlight and uh, all the guest stars, the the wardrobe, the feel of it. It's a very eerie episode. Um, and also, it's there, there's so much going on. I mean, it was definitely a take on, you know, the, you know, being of the body. You know, being of the communist party and and the, the you know the Red Scare. I mean, yeah. there was so much so to much the stuff episode. There, yeah. But but also in terms of like looking at it like a cult, how it applies to today. Uh, Return of the Archons. It's a it was a, it's a I used to think it's like a weird episode, a bizarre one. Uh, it is and eerie, but uh, absolutely resonates uh, like many of the others much more today than it did in '66. I agree. Is there an episode that got worse? On our review. Yeah. Uh, the last episode we recorded for the first season. Operation Annihilate. Yeah. Yeah. Because the the last act felt overstuffed. Oh, the last act is a problem. You see, it's so funny because there are other things in it that got way better yeah, for me. Yeah. So that, that one, I, that one's sort of mixed. The last act is terrible. Yeah, the, the last act, especially the part with the, the, the blindness and... Uh, uh, it, it just felt like it was overstuffed and overwritten in an effort to just kind of like wrap it up. But the other episode, I would say that it was already low in my estimation and went lower, obviously, is the alternative factor. Because you know what? I never, I always thought it was a bad episode. It's one that I never go back to rewatch. But after our discussion, I realized now I know why it does not work. Literally going to say the same thing. I never particularly liked it, but now I have the technical specs <laughs> of what's really not working. I'll, I'll tell you the other one, sadly, is the last act of Court Martial. There's just so much stuff where I'm like, why does Cogley have to leave? And why are they staying on the Enterprise? And why why, why are we doing it this yep, way? That's another one. It yep. just doesn't make a lot of sense. I love the episode. And, and, and this goes to one of those things that's true. If it, it, In TV, it's true in film. If you can create one awesome moment people will forgive a whole bunch of other stuff and cogly speech and there's moments in throughout that episode that are just great mm -hmm. and so you kind of you know glaze over when you're like things don't quite make sense in the final act but like when when we were talking about during the recording and during our special standalone episode that's that's actually next mm -hmm. uh when we were talking about the alternative factor the one merit of that episode is between Kirk and Spock in yeah. the briefing room. Yeah, absolutely. Because that was another aha moment where you realize that that Kirk Kirk's uh, history of of being being uh, a stack of books with legs paid off in his not just holding his own with Spock, but being one step ahead of them. But does that redeem the rest of the episode? Not really. Yeah. <laughs> I want to know yeah. what your favorite moments are of some of our characters, and I, I will start. Let's start with Uhura. What do you think is Uhura's best moment in season one? Well, I, I, you know, with Uhura, I feel like she was really underutilized. Yeah, and she's the is, most underutilized. She for me. and this is something that that even she will, uh, you know, it almost caused her to leave the first season, and I'll get to that in a bit. Um, but the, I guess, hearing her sing "Beyond Antares" mm -hmm. in "Conscience of the King" uh, was such a I mean, this is a science fiction series, and here's this woman who's a woman of color on the Enterprise, usually, you know, obviously usually on the bridge, that's where we usually see her, and she was giving this moment of comfort to a fellow crew member who was feeling down in engineering. It was just a really nice moment, and she had, a, I mean, it just, uh, it didn't, like, it was a, a revelation to her character, because, I mean, we heard her saying uh, in Charlie, Charlie X... Yeah. But this was a, 
beautifully directed episode. You know how much I love this episode. What about you? Um, I think those scenes, first of all, those scenes in the rec room, both in Charlie X and in uh, Conscience of the King, where you see her being kind of light and friendly, mm-hmm. um, those are a lot of fun. Um, the two for me are, strange enough, in the man trap, with the when the salt creature turns into the man who speaks Swahili to her, I think is really interesting. And then it's just two lines in Operation Annihilate, when Kirk comes down on her, and she is just strong, nothing but the facts, shuts him down. Yep, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, and she never raises her voice. Nope. Yeah. You know, she she keeps uh, unlike the naked time where Kirk is telling her, "Please cut off Riley." And she goes, "Sure, if I could, if you Don't yeah. you think I would?" Don't you, you know? think I would? Yeah. And she goes, "Okay, yes, sir, I'll keep trying." But yeah, she she does not break for a moment. What about Mr. Scott? <sighs> you know, Scotty James Dewan, I, I have to say Another big revelation was just seeing how much of a fine actor yeah. James Doohan really, really is. And everyone at Desilu and NBC knew that, which is why he started taking command yeah. more and more, why he started having bigger parts. And the scene in Operation Annihilate, when uh, Spock tries to knock him out so we can go back down to Deneva. And then Scotty gets up with the phaser and says, uh, hold up right there, Mr. Spock, or I'll stun you for sure, or whatever yeah. he says. Uh, I, I just thought, way to go, Scotty. <laughs> yeah, he's great. The, the, there are two for me. One is in uh, A Taste of Armageddon when he stands up to Ambassador Fox. Ambassador Fox. And Ambassador gives him an order and he goes, no, sir, I will not. Oh, absolutely. That, that is just, and he's so, and this is what's so great, what he does so well is he's so solid. He's so matter of fact, he's just telling you the truth. He's not trying to put a lot of spin on it. And the other that we talked about is literally, th- you know, four words or something in City on the Edge of Forever. When Kirk tells him, you're going to have to go back, and he takes that in and he says, I. And then he says, good luck, gentlemen. Mm, yeah, yeah. Good luck, gentlemen, is just so, you see... All of the thoughts that like, are going like, on. Good with luck. Him. I will, I may never see you again. Yeah, and I hope that you find something that works, and I hope that you succeed. I know that you're doing something really difficult. It's but, all in there. But but again, on the flip side today, when they come back through, what, what happened? You only left a moment ago. Yeah. If if Kirk and Spock and McCoy were not successful, there would have been no future for them to come back to. Like like they're going to go back to the past to try and alter the timeline or correct the timeline so let's say they they didn't what are they going to jump back through the time portal to yeah. the planet where the guardian is right no because because that that's the like the portal won't be there like they're not going to be able to they're not going to be able to get there uh because that that that's gone right that future for them is gone because mm. the timeline was altered so they came right back through because they were successful right and they restored it and they came back at the moment uh, right when they left. Yeah. And Scott, you know, what happened, sir? You only left a moment ago. It's such a brilliant, brilliant episode. And he is, you know, James Doohan, and we will certainly see this in season two and even in season three. James Doohan is one of the great actors of Star Trek. Totally. Mr. Sulu. Again, Mr. Sulu, uh, I mean, sure, Naked Time is a lot of fun. That's fine. I can't, I can't, it's naked. Throughout, and actually, he's great throughout the, he's got a big part in that episode. Yeah, yeah, even the stuff in, in when he and uh, he Riley. He and Riley, yeah. But know, him with the sword, that's it. That's my favorite Sulu moment. Yeah, 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 for sure. Okay. All right, who's next? Uh, McCoy. McCoy. Oh, you go first. It's, it's the steps of him coming back to it in City on the Edge of Forever. It's him with Edith Keeler. It's all those scenes. Those are, I think, my favorite McCoy scenes. Starting season. with when he goes back to the past and he doesn't realize where he is and he's looking up and he's completely Crazed, yeah. in a frenzy because of Cordrazine, of the, being overdosed. And he's looking at the constellations seem right. Oh, I sure wish I could see a hospital and starts talking about, you know, cutting people up yeah. and then he breaks down and passes out. You're right. The Forrest Kelly's range. Well, and it's particularly from the point where he goes to get that coffee smells good and you see. You see his his personality coming back, mm-hmm. and you see the levels of trying to figure out what's going on, and the kind like when he says to Edith Keeler, "I still don't, you know, believe any of this is real, but I think you're real." But, well, also, I mean, like he's that moment in the in the uh, mission. Oh, but I have another McCoy moment too. I just realized. Go ahead, yeah. keep going. Yeah, what, what that moment in the mission 
when yeah. he when he comes in and he's he is physically and emotionally spent. He's absolutely exhausted, but he still has still dealing with some of the effects of of the Corridors. He said, "No, no, I got to keep going. They'll, they'll they're looking for me." Yeah, you know my other McCoy moment. What's that? Con. If you oh, that's absolutely yeah, great. I mean, like, I would recommend cutting the carotid artery. You know, that scene is fantastic. Uh, I love the scene in the Enemy Within after the uh, good Kirk or the lighter Kirk saves the darker Kirk. You know, and he says, "You won't be afraid if you use your mind and think. Hold my hand. That's it. You yeah. can do it." And Kirk is telling McCoy, "Like, what do I have? Uh, you know, like, like, you know, the darker side of me has all these qualities." Where do, what, where do I have? And McCoy's telling him, you know, this, maybe that's where courage comes from. Yeah. For, see, he was afraid, and you weren't. Yeah, that's great. It's that's a, a great it's moment. A very tender moment. Uh, I, but I got to say, Kirk and McCoy argued quite a bit. Yeah. You know, there's a scene in the Corbo Night Maneuver. Yep. When anytime you can bluff me, doctor, and he says, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, scene in Man Trap when he goes, you know, how your lost love doesn't interest me. Right. Uh, I lost a man I want to know to kill him. And he says... Uh, well, it's a doc. Sorry. You know, I, I, yeah. I love stuff like that. Yeah. All right. It's going to get real hard now. Do you have a favorite Mr. Spock moment? A favorite Mr. Spock moment. Wow. You go first. <laughs> so I, I just, it's this side of paradise. I mean, like, because that's his episode. Nemo's performance throughout is amazing. The progression of what's happening to him when Kirk is insulting him in the transporter room when he first like laughs and then he's like I don't I want to get out of here and then starts to get angry is great and then the scene that you mentioned before him and Layla in the transporter room and if there are self-made pur- purgatories we all have to live in them oh what a line yeah. amazing that I I guess you know I mean that's a really really loaded question really tough to answer it's really tough yeah but but even though I don't love the episode, I still like the Galileo 7 a lot. And that moment uh, when he ignites, jettisons the yeah. fuel and ignites it. It's a great moment because of the realization that, that he's, I mean, still thinking logically because it was, logically speaking, it was really smart to light the fuel so yeah. that they could see it from the Enterprise as a flare. I think it was totally logical. But it was also an emotional yeah. one. And uh, I, I love that moment at the end. Kirk says, you're a stubborn man, Mr. Spock. And he goes, yes, sir. <laughs> um, you know, the other one, on the, on the other scale, the other side, him saying, I am attempting to create a mnemonic memory device using stone knives and bearskins. That's the best. I mean, that's that other, that's Spock in his funny, sarcastic Real. That's just a great Spock moment. You know, one of one of the episodes I, I I definitely rewatched after we recorded it. And again, it's just an episode that I rewatch all the time. Anyway, is sitting on the edge of forever. And again, like that moment where where he says we we must stop him, Jim. You know, the moment where McCoy says to Kirk, I "Could have, you deliberately stop me? Do you realize what you did?" And Spock goes. He knows, Doctor. He yeah. knows. Yeah. When, when I posted the photo of that moment on our Facebook page and shared it to the, to the other Star Trek Facebook groups, so many people commented, not realizing that, that other people have commented. Right. They wrote, he knows, Doctor. He knows. Yeah. Clearly, it's a powerful moment. Absolutely. And, and also, uh, you know, just the end of where no man has gone before. You know, I felt for him, too. Yeah, I that's a good one. I believe there's some hope for you after all, Mr. Spock. Great. I mean, this is all season one. All right. I'm, I'm not going to ask you what your favorite Kirk moment, because I think that is that is an impossible question. <laughs> I mean, impossible. If, you, if you have it, I'm certainly happy to hear the answer. I'm going to ask you, what is the quintessential Kirk moment? The Corbin might maneuver. Going to say the same thing. Yeah. Not chess, poker. Not chess, Mr. Spock, poker. I think that is the quintessential James T. Kirk that moment. That is just a stroke of brilliance. And then... You know, he hears Balok counting down, and you could see him yep. firm up, sit sit upright in his chair, and he's the captain of the Enterprise, and he goes into this whole long spiel about Corbomite, destroy yeah. the attacker, and just he goes from being in a place though of the of the entire Enterprise being in, in, in a place of of incredible vulnerability to being in charge, holding the cards. That's James T. Kirk saying, I am the captain now. Yep. 
100%. I think that is so sums up who Kirk is. And there, I mean, there is the Kirk speech power, which we see in Where No Man Has Gone Before, we see in Archons, we see in uh, Taste of Armageddon, that there's that thing that's so great. There's That's another aspect. There's the Kirk beating the odds, as in Aaron of Mercy, you know, there's those things. But yeah, Corbomite, it's hard to beat. It's hard. I mean, it's. A, I mean, you're, you're right. I mean, you know that we, we've quoted his line from "A Taste of Armageddon." Uh, uh, we're not going to kill today. In episodes before, yeah, <laughs> we even got to "A Taste of Armageddon," which is how strong that speech is. And uh, and I think that when we see Kirk give those sort of inspiration, aspirational Kirk-like speeches, like in a you know Omega Glory or yeah. or Metamorphosis. Uh, like th- those are the moments will make me go. This is this is why I will follow. I will follow James T. Kirk into an active volcano. But the Corbomite maneuver, which ironically, that moment, which which stands out for both of us, that we yeah. both thought of that moment. It was the first episode they shot as a regular season right. episode, and that's the moment that sticks out, which just goes to show how that episode uh, uh, set the stage, set the standard for so much of what followed in the character of Jim Kirk. Well, and this again, to to back up the statement, the first season of original series is the best first season of any Star Trek. We have the pilot, which we've already said has such so many quintessential Star Trek elements, right into Corbomite. Like just the first two episodes are better, I my guess is, than any of the first two episodes of any of the other series. Uh, absolutely. I completely agree. I mean, I had to think about it because I don't remember the first two episodes of Voyager. I kind, you know, or Enterprise. I kind of remember what you know, but but they're pretty good. Well, <laughs> you know? I, I mean, you know what the the uh, the first episode of Deep Space Nine Emissary is fantastic. That is really good. Yeah, it's like that after Where No Man in the Cage. I think yeah. it's probably the best season series opener. And Caretaker from Voyager is 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 very very strong. Uh, I would say even Broken Bow. The first uh, episode of Enterprise wow. is also very, very good. But uh, the first episode of uh, of Next Generation, Encounter Farm Point, is terrible. It's terrible. And <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to remember what the second one is, but it's... Ther- I- oh, the second one? You ready for this? Yeah. The Naked Now. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's <laughs> so bad. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. But, but, okay. I mean, like, like what... So, so after our individual deep dives over a six-month period... After this reassessment, this wrap up of season one, what are your closing thoughts of season one, Steve? Um, here's the thing with the cinephiles, I have almost never rewatched a movie that I did a deep, deep dive on. And the reason is, is because I spent so much time researching, so much time working on it that I'm kind of done. I'm not done with the first season of Star Trek, I haven't rewatched them yet, but I will, and I'll probably rewatch all of them. I am so blown away at how it really, really is good. And there's so many details of the performances, of the script, of the design, of the ideas where I go, this really, really was a special show. Because there's times where I have geek shame, you know what I mean? Where you go like, because particularly when you're our age and you might have gotten picked on for liking comic books and science fiction and things like that. Which I was. Yeah. And, and you know, you know what it is? When I felt love for this show, I felt ashamed. Oh, my God. You know? And, You're right. And I don't now. I mean, I didn't. I really haven't for the last 20 years either. But now I'm looking at it and going, no, this is a really, I'm going to bleep this out. This is a really f-ing good show. <laughs> and, 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 I'm, and I, as a professional filmmaker with a master's degree who has studied film really seriously for the last 25, 30 years, I am putting my official stamp that this show is f-ing good. I agree on every count. And I have to say that when I was a little kid and I was getting picked on for being a Trekkie, yeah. that was the period of my life where I had the the equivalent from a fan standpoint uh, of being ashamed. Although ashamed is definitely a very, very strong word. But I, I, I get what you're saying. And I completely share that assessment of, of that really, really short part of my life at that moment but for a show that clearly has informed my life in such a deep way and informed my life in ways that keep reaping new rewards 
over the years for different reasons, among them the fact that you and I are doing this deep dive podcast for the record yeah. of, 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 of appreciation for the show. I absolutely am also planting my flag on this is a great <laughs> show. It is absolutely like, again, like I said at the top of this conversation, I never thought it could be possible to love Star Trek more than I did, but I now do. And I have to say, I'm really curious to see where that love will go when we get into season two of the original series yes. on season two of Enterprise Incidents. Are there any episodes that you cannot wait to dive in on? You know, I'm literally, I brought up the list so I could refresh myself. The answer is there's so many. Yeah. it's There was a lot of great episodes. I think the episode, because part of what I'm thinking about isn't just what's an episode I love, but I'm also thinking about what episode is going to make for a great conversation. And the one that I feel like I'm most excited, I have, there are two. There's one episode I absolutely love that I think will make a great conversation. There's one episode is which is really really good, but I don't is not one of my favorites that's going to make for a fantastic conversation. The first is Mirror Mirror. I cannot I wait love it. Yeah. to I love the episode and I cannot wait to talk about it. I think there's so I've been thinking because I'm sure you've been doing this too of going like, "Oh, when we get to this episode, we're going to talk about this thing." Totally. There's a lot I have to say about Mirror Mirror that I I'm really curious to hear your thoughts on. And the other one, which is an episode I've always found difficult, but might be the episode that has come up more than any other episode from season 2 as we discuss season 1, and that is a private little war. I agree with you about a private little war. Yeah especially during our conversations of Aaron DeMercy and particularly of A Taste of Armageddon, yeah. I, I thought ahead to A Private Little War because I think after those two episodes in particular, that is the one that really, really had something to say. And, and as I've gotten older, I, I could feel that I've turned—I still love the episode, but I've, I've kind of turned on it in some ways because— uh, it's 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 ultimate decision has not aged well. Well, and spoiler alert, I don't know how I feel. I've been thinking about it. I haven't watched it again. Mm. I think I'm going to have, I'm going to try to watch it fairly early before we record it so I have time to think about it because my thoughts are not clear on what I would want to say about that episode. Uh, and I'm, I think that's a good, I think you absolutely should do that. Here's why. I, I don't know if I did this, but I did rewatch it uh, Private Little War pretty recently. Mm. And I think I, I either I texted you and said I'm watching this episode. Oh, I think you did, yeah. Yeah, yeah. okay. So the things that, that about that episode that I, I definitely had an opinion on, when I did the rewatch, there was something else about the episode that I also have an opinion on that I completely forgot about mm. until I rewatched it. So yeah, that's going to be a, a, a very, a, I would say, a very rewarding conversation. Yeah. But we got a while till we get to that. And I agree with you about Mirror Mirror. I mean, of course, like, I'm looking forward to the Doomsday Machine, Trouble with Triples, a mock time. But the the two episodes, for personal reasons, yeah. that I'm real excited about. So for everyone listening, if you were listening to our deep dive on this, this side of Paradise, you probably already know that my favorite single episode of Star Trek, period, is Ben Morgus's. And we're going to get to that really, really early because it was the second episode filmed for the second season of the original series. And I'm really, really crossing my fingers that Ralph Sinetsky, its director, will join us for a second time, and I, I think he will. Um, but just I just love that episode to pieces, and that is an episode that I've grown to love more and more over the years and, and, and as, I, as I get older. But the other episode that I just really, really love because it's a lot of fun and it's another episode I can't wait to talk about. Is by any other name? Oh, interesting. Uh, the Kelvins. Yeah. And, uh, well, that's got some great fun moments. Yeah, Absolutely, fun. yeah. It's fun. Yeah. It's also an episode that has a shift in tones because it's very, very serious. Yeah. But then it gets kind of fun. Funny, totally. You know? but like, totally. But it's a it's a great shift in tones, and I'm really looking forward to talking about those two episodes. Okay, so we talked about the episodes we're most looking forward to. Are there episodes in season two that you are absolutely dreading getting you know, into? That, that's a that's a really, really big word, dreading. Because there really 
isn't an episode of season two that I dislike as much as I dislike the alternative factor or as much as I dislike, well, a few episodes of the third season. Like, there's no episode, no episode to me in the second season is as bad as Alternative Factor or some of those episodes in season three. I would say the episode that I like the least or a couple of the episodes that I just don't really watch very often are Patterns of Force. Uh, and even though I like the special effects in the Immunity Syndrome, I don't love the Immunity Syndrome. The Immunity Syndrome, to me, is like the... the uh, Operation Annihilate of season two. It has some good merits in the development of the friendship between Kurt yeah. Spock and McCoy, but it's just not an episode that I particularly like. It has, yeah. There's one thing with Kirk Spock and McCoy and immunity syndrome I like. You, you, by the way, you took the words right out of my mouth. There's nothing I'm dreading, like, but there are a couple of episodes that actually patterns of force I'm looking forward to. I feel like that's there's a good conversation in there. Uh, it's a mixed episode for me, but I think it's a good conversation. Um, uh, there's a couple of immunity syndrome is one that I just, I even forget it exists. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. and the other one is Friday's child. I never, I don't pay any attention. To, like that's never one that I rewatch. Yeah. It's okay. It's, yeah. it's completely fine. Yeah, the thing that I like about, uh, about Friday's child is, is the score, the mm. music. Well, uh, I'll pay more attention to that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there you go. But yeah, I mean the fact that there is no like, Oh my God, this is going to be a tough one. Um, when we get to season three, uh, season three there are a few. We're, we're going to be eating those words. Yeah. But but I am very, very excited about season two of Enterprise Incidents. And for everyone who, again, who listened to season one, wait till you hear our deep dives on season two. These, the, you are not going to want to miss our deep dives of a mock time, Mirror Mirror, Trouble with Tribbles, the Doomsday Machine, the Changeling. I mean, there are so many. Yeah. yeah the, the, there are so many great episodes of season. But, but season two, you know, before we before we before we move forward onto season two, which we are going to do with an episode that uh, uh, I wouldn't say it's a one of the better ones, but it's also a fun one. So there were a lot of changes, Steve, that came about for season two. So first of all. Season one of Star Trek aired on Thursday nights at 8.30 p.m. on NBC. So for Friday, for, for, the, for season two, for season two, Star Trek moved to Friday nights at 8.30. Not a great idea because what are the high school students and the college kids doing on Friday nights? They're staying home and studiously doing their homework so they can get it all done so they could watch Star Trek? That's exactly what they are not doing. Damn it! They are going out. They are going to the movies. They're going out on dates. And maybe they are waiting until after Star Trek is over before they can do that because they still have time in the night. But already there's a bit of a problem here because, because some, of these, some of these students and teenagers aren't going to stay home and watch Star Trek. So that was a bad move. Well, couldn't but, they just like tape it on their VCR or catch it on YouTube later? You know what? They could just stream it on there. There you go. I don't what's the problem? <laughs> what's the problem? The other thing is the opening theme song. Oh. The opening theme song was so different from what than it was in the first season. For one thing, so the first nine episodes of the first season were composed by Alexander Courage, who, who uh, you know, he wrote the score and also composed the score with these, uh, this, like, electric violin sound that Gene Roddenberry hated, and, and he especially hated when that was used in uh, 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 The Man Trap, which right. was composed by Courage. So uh, Fred Steiner came in and re-recorded the, the theme song for the first season, which is why it sounds different for the rest of the first season. Mm. So for season two, Alexander Courage got his sort of theme back because he went in to re-record the theme song. And if you watch, when you watch season two, you notice the sound of a woman's voice. I have noticed that. That, that woman, her name is Lily Jean Norman. And her voice was mixed with a muted trumpet, a flute, a vibraphone, and an organ to give the season two and season three theme 
uh, a, a really unique sound. Which it definitely has. And it definitely has, and I love it. And I feel like that's the quintessential Star Trek theme song is the theme from the second season. See, I like it less. I like it without the voice. I appreciate it. The voice dates it to me. It feels very much mid-60s sci-fi. That's, but, but it also which feels, it is. Yeah, which it is, yes. But also, see, I, you know, and I was thinking about this because I was re-watching uh, Day of the Dove. And, uh, and I, you know, I know it's third season, but, but the, I was thinking about the score because I just took all these notes about it. Right. And I just think it sort of gives a, an otherworldly Absolutely. sound to it, for sure. Now, the other thing was that made the, the theme so, so more prominent was they added a little more reverb to William Shatner's oh. spoken narration. And if you compare his spoken narration of season one to a spoken narration in season two, you can hear it sounds more booming because it has more of a reverb. Also added was the pushing sound. Oh, that, that was ah. flying by the screen because that was not there for season one. The other thing that was added was a credit during the, 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 during the second season theme song where it says Star Trek and it says the words created by Gene Roddenberry. Now, that was part of the first season, but only for two episodes. Hmm. I believe it was for, for uh, The Man Trap and Charlie Yates. Hmm. And then that went away. But, or it was definitely for two episodes in the beginning of the first season. It might have been those two episodes. I might be wrong. But definitely from the second season on, it always said Star Trek created by Gene Roddenberry. So another big change was the, the conscious decision to use directors who had already directed Star Trek. And I've spoken to you many times about how I feel like Star Trek really hit its stride in the second half of the first season. And that continued into season two. Because what did you have by the end of season one? You had, well, Gene Kuhn. So now he's still the showrunner at the beginning mm -hmm. of season two. Mark Daniels, who was there in the beginning because he directed The Man Trap and The Naked Time, so he is one of the revolving directors that they're now going to use. Mm -hmm. The other is Joseph Penton, right. who directed City on the Edge Forever. So these two guys are going to go back and forth, and they're also going to add Ralph Sinensky into right. the mix because he was brought on to direct Metamorphosis and Obsession and uh, Return to Tomorrow. And also, the directors and writers of the episode, at the end of season one, they were, they were at the end of the last act. So now they're in the beginning of the first act right after the title right. of the episode. And the font in this is all the same. Like, a lot of changes, more changes than you probably probably give it credit for. Now, here's the thing. When they were about to really get into season two, the Emmy nominations were announced. Mm. So who was nominated? Uh, Shatner and Nimoy, right? Just Nimoy. Just Nimoy. Oh. Not Shatner. Ooh. So what do you think happened? Um, I think Nimoy wanted more money. Well, well, that, that definitely happened. But what else happened? Well, it's a little bit of a bruised ego. Yeah. On the part of Wait, are you saying Shatner has like an ego? No, not Shatner. Uh, but he was, uh, uh it did, it, it was the, it was the source of tension as the rest of the series went on. Uh, I mean, they became really friendly when they started making the movies. But during the production of the original series, after Nimoy was nominated for supporting actor and Shatner was passed over for lead actor, there, there was definitely tension that brewed between them. Right. And the other thing was that when, when Roddenberry was gearing up for season two, he sought the advice of Isaac Asimov on, on what what he should do to make the show better, especially on the part of Shatner. So he, he feels like he's still like the star of the show. Yeah. So one thing that Asimov said was have Kirk get into more situations where he has to change his appearance. Okay. So, so, okay, great. I mean, he did that in, you know, piece of the action and patterns of force, uh, bread circuses, mm -hmm. um, and definitely the deadly years. Yep. But he also, suggested to Roddenberry, and this was a great idea, was to make Kirk and Spock more of a team. Mm -hmm. 
And I don't you feel yeah like they work more of it more of a team in season two. I mean, two it's onwards? happened starting at the at, at the end of season two with Devil in the Dark and Aaron of Mercy and thing and, and City in the Age of Forever, of course. But yes, there were a lot of team up episodes in season two. Absolutely. Okay. The other thing is, of course, the Forest Kelly. So after being in all but three episodes of the first season. And being a very, very major part of that trio, like, of course, it was bound to happen. And this was initiated by associate producer Robert H. Justman that DeForest Kelly would be giving a top billing along with William Shatner and Leonard Nimoy during the opening credits. So in the first two seasons, it says starring William Shatner, also starring Leonard Nimoy as Mr. Spock. So DeForest Kelly's name was added to the second season and also added was a raise where DeForest Kelly went from a whopping $850 per episode to a whopping $1,250 per episode. My goodness. Even by today's standards, that is awful. But Steve, you hit on something really, really important, and that is Nimoy wanted more money. Yeah. And we talked about this a bit during, uh, during A Balance of Terror because of, of the actors Mark Leonard and Lawrence Montaigne, who played uh, Theseus. Mm-hmm. So, so Spock was starting to be like the most popular character, right. getting all the fan mail. So Leonard Nimoy's agent, his name is Alex Brewis, demanded $9,000 per episode, star billing, star perks, a larger percentage of mer- merchandising, and greater script input, or Nimoy would not report to work. And this is all before obviously right. season two starts going. So what do you do? Like, I mean, this is something that happens all the time. Yep. So Gene Roddenberry sent a memo to the Trek producers. He said, I won't play that game, nor will Desilu. I've been working with Joe D'Agosta, who is the casting director, on recreating the part and, re- re- and creating a new Vulcan science officer who can go to work on our show. And that casting director, Joe D'Agosta, had, a, had an A-list, a B-list, and a C-list. But Mark Leonard, Lawrence Montaigne, and even David Carradine from Kung Fu fame was on, were, were on the wish list. So Herb Solo, who was the executive in charge of production at Desi and oversaw Star Trek, said to Leonard Nimoy's agent, Quote, if your client doesn't report to work under his current contract, the studio will consider him to be in breach of that contract, terminate him, sue him, and find some other actor to wear the pointed ears. Remember, it's not important who plays the role. Any good actor can do that. It's the pointed ears that count. They're the star. Wow. Wow, right? So... With all of these things, and I would never be good at any of these negotiations because you have to play hardball, you know, because one side's playing hardball, you, they'll walk all over you if you don't play hardball back. That's what you have to do. The, the statement, what matters is the pointed ears, is the stupidest thing. Uh, I mean, now it is. Yeah, yeah. Well, it is, period. I mean, like anyone, you know, if you, there's this quote has been attributed to a whole bunch of different directors, including Elliot Kazan and Alfred Hitchcock and uh, William Wyler and a bunch of other people, but their quote is, Directing is 90% casting. The person who wears the pointed ears is important. Nobody else could have done what Nimoy did. Like, like, is it true that the script is also important? Absolutely. Is it true that the director is important? Of course. And costuming and makeup, all those things are important. But I bet as much as they were playing hardball, they were scared to lose Nimoy. Well, they were scared to lose Nimoy. Nimoy, Nimoy got his raise... He went from $1,125 per episode to $2,500 per episode, plus $100 for expenses, better billing, better merchandising, and more script input. He would also receive a raise of $500 per episode for each year to follow, plus residuals that would be increased through the fifth repeat. So, so Nimoy got his raise, and then actually, even though his agent... As for nine thousand, he really would have been happy with twenty five hundred, and yeah. that's what Nimoy got was twenty five hundred. Well, that's what negotiation is. You know, this is why I'm not good at it. Is you say I want this thing, and then you are willing to come back. 
One big change mm -hmm. that, that fortunately didn't happen was Michelle Nichols' return for season two. But by the end of season one, she told Gene Roddenberry that she was leaving because she just didn't feel yeah. that Uhura had much to do beyond saying hailing frequencies open. And so according to her account, or her memory of the situation, Michelle Nichols was at a fundraiser. Uh, as, she, as she recalls it, it was for the NAACP, but she's not 100% sure. But she was at an event, and uh, someone came up to her and said, I'm your biggest fan. And that, of course, was Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And she said, oh, well, actually, I'm leaving the show. And he talked her into saying, staying, saying, look, basically, I'm paraphrasing here, but, yeah, I'm sure you're probably not happy with the, this, the, uh, uh, with the lines you're getting, but the fact that you, a woman of color, are on the bridge of the ship, of, and, and it, is, it is just, you're all part of a, an ensemble crew, and your presence there is just way, way, way too important. You cannot leave. So Michelle Nichols went back to Roddenberry and told, her, told him the story. And she said, okay, you know, I, I, I can't leave. I, I, I'm going to yeah. stay. So Roddenberry opened up his desk and uh, took out a uh, resignation letter that she wrote, and he had ripped it up. Mm. He already ripped it up. And he said, welcome back. That's good. So one final change, and I'll get into this when we get into the first episode of season two is Welcome Aboard, Mr. Chekhov. Yeah, well, we'll definitely get to talk about that. And we can't wait to go on this journey with you. And you know what? I'd like to know, what are the episodes you're looking forward to the most? Or are there any episodes that you are dreading? The best place to have this conversation is on our Facebook page. Do a search for Enterprise Incidents. You can also follow the show on Twitter at Enter Incidents, on Instagram at Enterprise Incidents. You can subscribe to the show if you haven't already. Pick your favorite platform. Maybe it's Apple Podcasts, where we'd love you to leave a review. Maybe it's YouTube, where you can join us in commenting on each episode, and we have conversations there. It's also on Spotify and Stitcher and a whole bunch of other places. Scott, if people wanted to find you on the internet, how would they do that? Well, you just follow me on Twitter and Instagram at MovieMance, and you can absolutely make sure that you share Enterprise Incidents across social media. Share it with Star Trek fans, whether they are diehard fans of the original series or casual fans of Star Trek in general. But we are getting so many comments from people who are, who are discovering the original series for the very first time because they are listening to Enterprise Incidents. So please do absolutely positively share Enterprise Incidents because we're really proud of it, and we know you're loving it, and we are grateful for your support. You can follow me at SR Morris on Twitter, SR Morris one on Instagram. You can listen to my other podcast, The Cinephiles, with my partner, John Roca. But what I'm really excited about, okay, it's season two. Scott, where are we going first? Well, the first episode that we're going to cover on season two, I always had a fun time watching this one. And the beauty is that we are going to drop this episode on Halloween Day. Of course, the episode is Cat's Fall. So make sure you come back for our season two premiere of Enterprise Incidents, covering the very first episode produced for the second season of Star Trek. And until then, you know what we say, keep going boldly. <laughs>